Today's lesson is Sola Scriptura, the one true church according to Scripture. There is one true church, yet there are many that claim to be the one true church. So what I would like to do is to give you a list of some of those who claim to be the true church. We have Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, Assyrian Church of the East, Ancient Church of the East. It's quite a bit, right? But wait, there's more. Christian churches and churches of Christ. Lutherans, Baptists, Churches of Christ, Stone Campbell Movement, the Christadelphians, all of these churches, including ours, our denomination, claims to be the one true church because a part of the movement was going to restore God's church. So supposedly this denomination is a denomination that has restored God's true church. That's what they say. Continuing, we have the Amish, Holdem and Mennonites, Quakers, Methodists, International Bible Students, Jehovah Witnesses, Oneness Pentecostals who believe that th there is no Trinity, and, e and even in some of these churches and in this church, if you were baptized somewhere else, that's not good enough. You have to be baptized into their church. Then you have the Latter-day Saints and Seventh-day Adventists. The Roman Catholic Church claims to be, and I had one person text me and say, it's not Roman Catholic, it's Catholic. And he sort of sort of jumped on me. He said, you don't even know what it's called. And I, my response was, uh, false teaching by any other name is false teaching. The Roman Catholic Church claims to be the one true church because of apostolic succession. Apostolic succession. They trace their apostolic succession, they trace their founding back to Peter, whom they say Jesus declared to be the first pope. And there are a lot of churches. There is a branch of Baptists to say, well, they go all the way back to the church. They, everyone is trying to go back to the apostles. I'm not trying to go back to the apostles. I just want to be connected to Jesus. How about you? <laughs> be connected to Jesus Christ. That's the important thing. Well, Jesus asked the question, who do people say that I am? And some said, you know, you're the Christ, you're that you are a prophet, Elijah. And then Jesus asked the disciples, well, who do you say that I am? And we find the response in Matthew 16, verse 16. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, verse 17. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon, by Jonah. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. The fact that Jesus is the Christ is not something that is revealed by man. It is declared by man. It is proclaimed by man, but it is revealed by God alone. It is the Holy Spirit who enables a sinner to understand the word of God. The gift of faith enables us to understand that God is God and he is holy and we are not. And that we stand in need of a savior and the only savior is Jesus Christ. Continuing in verse 18 of Matthew 16. I also say to you that you are Peter, meaning Petros. That word Peter is Petros in the Greek, meaning a rock. And upon this rock, the word rock here is Petra, meaning the testimony concerning Christ, the rock revealed by divine revelation. I will build my church. The word church there is ecclesia, meaning call out ones. And the gates of Hades, death, the power of Satan will not overpower it. So if you read every, if you read it where it says, I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. They took that to mean that God, Jesus was saying, I'm going to build my church upon you, Peter. But that's not what Jesus was saying. Why? Just as in English, we only have one word for love. 
But there are different words in Greek for love. There are different words for rock in Greek. And when he said, you are Peter, meaning you are a rock, you are a small rock. And upon this rock, Petra, what rock? Remember, he previously said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven has revealed that I am the Christ. So it is a divine revelation of the truth of whom Christ is. That's how God is. Jesus himself is going to build his church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Why? Because it is God who's building the church, not a denomination. Amen. You see, we have to go deeper sometimes than what we see. The word we see rock, rock, we think, well, that's, that's a rock. There's a rock. No, but they have a different meaning. Petros is a rock. Peter, whenever you see Petros, it's really talking about Peter or a small rock. But we see Petra is talking about Jesus Christ. What was Peter understanding of what Jesus said? Well, if the, if the Roman Catholics, so they say that, that Peter was the first pope, it would follow that Peter would understand the same thing, wouldn't it? So let's look at what let's look at Peter's understanding of what Jesus said. And we find this in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. We'll start at verse 4. And coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. So Who's the him? Jesus. What, as to what? A living stone. So Peter is calling Jesus a living stone and precious in the sight of God. Jesus Christ is precious in the sight of God. He is God's only begotten son, his first, the, the firstborn, or he's the preeminent one of all creation. Jesus Christ was not created, but he is preeminent over everything that was created. So G Peter described Jesus as a living stone. Verse five, you also as what? Living stone. Stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What is the sacrifice? Present your bodies as a what? Living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Peter understood that he was not the rock, he was a rock. Jesus Christ alone is the rock upon which the true church is built. It's not built upon a denomination. It is not built upon Peter. It is built upon Jesus Christ. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. Aren't you glad about that this morning? Only Jesus, Jesus alone. The one true church is not a denomination but it's made up of individuals, saved individuals, the ecclesia, the called out ones who offer themselves as living sacrifices to God. This eliminates the need for priests and ceremonial practices to be made right with God. You don't need a mass. You don't need a priest. Do you know that in AD 70, I may have said this already, but I got to keep saying it. Repetition is the best form of, of learning. In A.D. 70, the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem. The temple was destroyed. The priesthood was abolished. The sacrifices were abolished. Matter of fact, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was rent. So he, that was a foreshadowing of what was going to happen. Jesus Christ destroyed the whole Jewish system. It was done away with. But here comes a church that wants to resurrect the Jewish system. The purpose of the priest was to offer sacrifices pleasing to God. So when you go into a Catholic church, the priest stands before what? An altar. In the Old Testament, the priest stood at the altar to make sacrifices pleasing to God. In the church, there is no altar. There are no 
priests. Why? We have free access to God and the one sacrifice necessary to cleanse all sin has been made once and for all through the precious Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So we don't need priests. So when they go to, to when they go to a mass, what they're doing is calling down Jesus. What they say in their writings is that the priest has the power to bring Christ down from heaven and put him into a wafer so he can be sacrificed over and over and over again. But our Bible tells us he was sacrificed once for all. Now, I understand that there are not every, see, you can be a part of something and not know everything that group teaches. There, see, a, a lot of people, when I say things about Seventh-day Adventism, they'll say, well, that's not what I believe. It's not, I'm not talking about what you believe. I'm talking about what they teach and what you have to believe in order to be a part of them. Everybody doesn't believe the same, but don't look at what the individuals believe. Look at what the, te what the church teaches. And if you find what they're teaching is diametrically opposed to what scripture says, you need to get up out. Amen. So he understood. Peter understood. He didn't, he didn't consider himself the Pope. He considered himself one of many rocks, verse six. For this is contained in scripture. Where, 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 where is it contained? Tradition. Scripture. And he's quoting Isaiah 28, verse 16. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. And he who believes in the traditions of the church will not be disappointed. And that believes in what? Him, the stone. Peter quoted scripture, not tradition, to identify the one true church. You know, I've learned something. Don't believe someone is something just because they tell you they're something. Take a little time and watch them. Watch them. They'll let you know exactly who you are, who they are. They'll let you know. And if they walk around pious, and looking, you know, oh, we are the answer. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, any man that thinks that they are the answer or that they contain any group that thinks that they contain all of the truth known to God, they're crazy. They're crazy. They're talking out of their mind. Lord willing, next we're going to talk about the need to be washed from brainwashing. There's a need to be washed. From brainwashing. Denominations will disappoint you, right? They will disappoint you. Look at the Methodist church this week. The, the big old uproar that now they're you know, ordaining gay, gay, you know, LGBT. They're accepting all of this. And the same thing is happening to Southern Baptists, that they're, they're bringing in all this stuff. You know, I heard someone say, when, when did all of this turmoil start in the Methodist church? I'll tell you when it started. He said it started in 1954, 57, back in the 1950s, when they first ordained women. Oh, Dana, there you go, being a chauvinist. No. The Bible says, Paul says, I will not let allow a woman to teach over a man. God called men to be his representatives in the world, in the earth. And so God has, so it's there in the scripture that he's called men because he made Adam responsible for his creation. That's the natural order since creation. But they allowed women to be. So what is that spirit that comes in? It's feminism. We want the right to preach. So once you let one ism in, you're going to have another train of isms following all the way. Once you start going against the scripture in one little, oh, let me put it this way. A little leaven leavens the whole loaf. Amen. Verse seven. This precious value then is for you who believe. He's saying earlier that the stone is precious to God, but this precious value then is for you who believe? Well, who believe? The living stones. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very 
cornerstone. Now, Daniel, you're using that word stone. But in Matthew, he's talking about rocks. Well, how do you know they mean the same thing? Well, him, it could be talking about something totally different. All righty then. Jesus did mention stone. The word of God does mention stones and rocks. If you get hit by a stone or get hit by a rock, it's going to hurt. And it's going to cause damage, isn't it? Verse 8. And a stone of stumbling and a what? Oh, there it is. And a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the church's teachings. And to this doom they were also appointed. Did I get that wrong? What did I get wrong? Oh, to the word. What is the word? Scripture. Scripture. Not some tradition. Not a committee that gets together and sits in a room. And you see, I heard this one priest say this, that the idea of the church determining theology happened in Acts 15. In Acts 15, there were some Judaizers that were coming and saying that the Gentiles had to be circumcised in order to be accepted as Christians. So they had a council in Jerusalem. And who was there? The apostles were there. And they decided and sent a letter saying that we have decided, we agree with the Holy Spirit, and we believe that these are the only things that you must do as Gentiles. So they sent a letter. So here comes the Catholic Church and other uh, councils trying to piggyback on that. Here's the problem. Ain't now an apostle at none of them meetings. Am I right? The purpose of an apostle is to lay the foundation. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3 that I as an apostle have laid the foundation. Matter of fact, I was thinking about this this morning. In heaven, the foundations, you're going to find the name of the 12 apostles is built upon the foundation of the apostles. Not upon tradition, but upon the apostles who wrote down what God inspired them to write down for our benefit. You know what's happening with the word of God is the same thing that's happening with the constant of the United States. They're not the same thing. Let's not get it twisted. You don't need to put the Constitution in the Bible and the church said? Amen. That's not the word of God. But we can see what is happening. You have people back in, 17, in the 1770s, they wrote a Constitution. And so now you've got people saying, well, they didn't know this was going to happen and they didn't know this was going to happen. So we need to change the, the Constitution. Well, they do the same thing with the Bible. Well, Peter didn't understand that, 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 that things would be more liberal or Paul or Jesus didn't understand that, that, that society would change and homosexual marriage and all of this stuff would be different. So we have to change the scriptures. We've got to get things up to date. Let me tell you something. They are, they are destined to doom. They are appointed to doom. Why? Because they do not believe the word of God. And why is it that we, the people of God, must acquiesce to them? Why? Why don't they ever come over to us? Why do we always have to go to them? And then we have foolish church leaders who go traipsing over. Yeah, we want to be like society. I'm not trying to be like society. I don't look good in skinny jeans and I ain't putting them on either. I don't need to wear skinny jeans and my shirt open down to here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. All we need is the word of God and the word of God sets us free. My Lord, I don't understand this. What do I do? Let me, let me, let me, let me rephrase it. I understand it because Jesus said in the last days, there will be people who have a form of godliness, but deny the power. And the power of godliness is to become more like Christ, not to become more like society. The word says that if the world loves you, be careful because they didn't love Christ. But if they love you as a preacher, you know you're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 9, but you, you who, who believe and find precious value in the stone are a chosen race. What kind of race? 
chose. Oh, we don't like that word. No, we chose God. No, God said, I, you didn't choose me. I chose you. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Ecclesia called out ones. He called you out. So for what purpose? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has, oh, there it is, called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The church are the called out ones, the ones who've been called out of the world. And you don't have to be a building. The church is not a building. The church does not have headquarters in Rome. The church doesn't have headquarters in St. Louis or wherever. The church is headquartered in the kingdom of God. And we, the people of God, occupy the church. We make up the church. Those who have been called out by God himself and he alone is Lord. He is the foundation of our church. It was Peter who first preached the message about Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And it was according to the will of God. Why? God was calling or taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. He was calling them out. He called you out. Aren't you glad? He called, we don't like being called out. You know, when you were little, you were doing something bad and people called you out. The little teacher said, what are you doing? Son, you don't like that. But aren't you glad Jesus called you out, called you by name, exposed our foolishness and said, come unto me, all that labor and heaven laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and humble of heart and I will give rest to your souls. Are you resting this morning? Resting in the truth of Jesus Christ. The one true church is made up of members who have been called out of darkness and baptized into Christ. I'm going to say that again. Baptized into Christ. And what is the result? It's a sanctified life that glorifies God. Verse 10. For you, you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And the church said, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Verse 11, beloved, I urge you, because you have received mercy, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. It's the same thing Paul said in Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Same thing. So what does that tell you? As Christians, as the church, we still sin. We still sin. But we don't have to go in the corner, in the booth, in the dark, in the back to some priest to confess our sins because we have a high priest, Jesus Christ, who in all points was tempted as we are and yet he was without sin. He can hear our petition and only he can forgive our sins. Amen. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive our sins and what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, that's good news. I don't have to get dressed to confess. I go down to some booth. In spite of all the confusion Satan has unleashed in the world concerning God's true church, there is no confusion with God. 2 Timothy 2, 19. There, nevertheless, even though with all this confusion, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. Say it with me. The Lord knows those who are his. And everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. How? Walking according to the spirit. Galatians 5, 16, Romans 8, 5 through 8. We abstain from wickedness because we belong to God. Not in order to belong to God. Not in order to stay in God. We can't get out of God if we try because he saved us. We are the sheep of his pasture. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. That's good news. 
But I've got Christians that will argue me down. No, no, no. God, no, no, no. You could lose your salvation. Why would you want, why, 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 why would you want to believe that? When the scripture says that he who began a good work is faithful to complete it, when we say we can lose that a truly saved person can lose their salvation, what we are saying is that God is incapable of doing what he said he would do. I refuse to be guilty of that. God knows the wheat from the tares, doesn't he? He knows the wheat from the tares. And he knows in another parable, he talked about the good seed, which he plants and the bad seed, which the enemy planted. And he said, leave them alone because in the last days, the angels will separate them. He knows who are his and the wheat don't necessarily show up at the same barn, right? They're not growing in the same field. You've got wheat in all kinds of denominations, but those denominations aren't the wheat. Get it? Denomination. There is no denomination on the face of this planet that is the one true church. The one true church consists of those the Lord knows. Hallelujah. He knows them. He knows you. That's why in the last days you're going to say to those who claim to be a part of him, depart from me, you doers of iniquity. I never knew. He's not going to say, I knew you, but you were so bad, I am not going to claim you now. No, he says, I never knew you. Why? He whom the son sets free is free indeed. The slave is not a part of the house forever, but the son is. We are the children of God and we are part of the household of faith Forever. Somebody needs to be glad about that. The one true church is the invisible church known to God alone. It is headquartered in heaven and in the hearts of all who believe. Amen. Luke 6, 47 says, everyone who comes to me and hears my word, hears my what? Words. Where do we find his words? In scripture and acts on them. It is you're not saved because you act on them. You act on them because you hear and understand the words. Faith produces obedience. Again, verse 47, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them by grace. How do they act on them? By grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Isn't that right? I will show you whom he is like. Verse 48, he is like a man building a house, meaning a spiritual life, who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And that word rock is Petra, meaning Christ, not Petros, Peter. That word in the Greek here, rock, is again talking about Christ, laid the foundation on Christ. And when a flood occurred, the torrent or the gates of hell burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. Why was it well built? It was built on the rock, Jesus Christ. That's why when you're going through hell itself, you don't lose your mind. Because your rock, you are tied to the rock. And it's not you holding on to the rock. It's the rock holding on to you. He's sitting on, you ever see a child, you know, your father may play and you sit down sometimes with the grandchildren and I'll pin them down and they can't get, they're trying to get out and they can't get out. That rock is on you so tight, you can't get out. There's no way Jesus got you wrapped up, tied up and tangled up in him. Ephesians 4, 4 says this. There is one body and one spirit. What spirit? The spirit who seals believers in Christ until the day of redemption, according to Ephesians 1.13. Just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. What is our hope? The redemption of our bodies. Verse 5, one Lord. Who's Lord? Jesus Christ. One faith. What faith? The faith once for all handed down to saints, Jude 1.3. One One baptism into Christ, not a church. Verse six, one God and father of all who is over all, through all and in all. Amen. So let's break this down. We see the Trinity here. Do you see the Trinity? One spirit, the Holy Spirit, one Lord, 
Jesus Christ, one Father, God the Father. Right here. So it is God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that keeps the church. It is built upon the foundation of Christ, and Christ is God, and the three are one. Therefore, we worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we are one body. What is that body? We are the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. And as the body of Christ, we have one hope, one faith, and one baptism. Amen. We are one in God. That is the true church. One body, invisible to the human eye, but totally visible to God. Because everyone that claims to be of God is not of God. And only God knows those who belong to him. And you will know you will belong to him. How do you know? Dana, how do you know? But, but Dana, I, I don't know if I'm saved. I, I don't know. See, here's the thing. If you wonder about it, that's a good thing. Because people who aren't saved, don't worry about it. <laughs> people who aren't saved, don't worry about being saved. But if because you're concerned about it, that means you want to make sure you're right with God. And because of that, you are careful. You, when you sin, it bothers you. It bothers you. Sin does not, I'm not, let me rephrase that. It's the sin that bothers you, not the consequences. Because sinners hate the consequences, but love the sin. They want to keep doing the sin, but want to avoid the consequences. But you know you love God and you belong to him when you actually hate the sin and grieve over the sin because you know it offends God. Amen. And you struggle with sin. Unbelievers don't struggle with sin. They struggle to get out of the consequences. So when you hear somebody coming, well, I need help. Well, what do you need help with? You need to get out of the consequences or do you want to get out of the sin lifestyle? That's the question. Because Jesus died. He died for, uh, this is the gospel. I'm going to say it one more time. That Jesus died for our Sins, according to scripture. And he was buried and rose again, according to the scripture. He rose again so that we could be raised to new life. He died so that our sin nature could die. Amen. So therefore, we're not saved so we can get out of consequences. Being saved is not a get out of hell card. Being saved is being changed body, soul, mind, and spirit card. Amen. Revelation 19 verse 7 says, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride, his church, the ecclesia has made herself ready. How has she made herself ready? Verse 8, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Who are the saints? The called out ones. Notice, no, notice this. The, it's the little things that make the difference. In verse 8, it was given to her. She didn't just up and clothe herself in righteousness. We're not talking about religion. You see... Adam and Eve clothed themselves with fig leaves, trying to make themselves right with God. But the bride of Christ, it was given to her, just as God in the garden killed the animal and clothed them. It was given to them to clothe themselves in the righteousness of God. Therefore, you're not saved by your works. You are saved by the grace of God alone. Verse nine, then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. Scripture, scripture, the church rests and finds comfort in scripture. I stand alone on the word of God, not the teachings of a church. Test every teaching. We need to test every teaching of this denomination against the word of God. And where they split, we're going to go with scripture. Amen. Amen. 
Oh, I'm, I'm serious. Because I grew up Seventh-day Adventist and we were taught what we, we were told what we were supposed to believe. And if you were to ask a question, oh, you are a problem. If you sat in what was called Sabbath school, it wasn't Sunday school, it was Sabbath school. And you start bringing something up, well, they'll shut you up because, you know, well, you know, this is what we believe. And the way you want to know how I'm, I'm why I'm no longer a Seventh Day Adventist, because God in his providence had me go to a church. We first moved to Nashville, sit in a church, and the sermon was, this is what Adventists believe. And the pastor said, if you don't believe this, you're not an Adventist. Huh. Uh huh. Hmm. Because I would sit in church while they were yammering about Ellen White and all that. I would sit there reading Colossians. And I was sitting there reading Ephesians. I was sitting there reading the epistles. And I found out what they were saying was diametrically opposed to what the word of God said. So God in his providence had me sit there and listen. And by the end of that sermon, I closed the book and I said goodbye and I ain't been back since. And not going back. How did Glennis, now you got to understand, Glennis, mama, <laughs> baby girl, she grew up, we both grew up seven in Venice, our family. But one day we went to, a, we went to a, a, a baptism and you weren't baptized into Christ, you were baptized into the church and you had to say, I will not eat pork, I will not this, I will do this and I will not, it was all, and it was, Glennis said it was almost like they were taking a mallet going, bam, bam. Bam, and by the time you finish, all, you're like this. You can't move. There was no freedom in that. And that caused her to start reading the Bible for herself. You want the cure to release religion? Read the Bible. Amen. Read the scriptures. And the word of God will set you free. So where do we find the one true church? We find it in Jesus Christ. And it consists of the called out one, the ecclesia. The saints of God, not saints because people voted them to be saints. It's saints because God elected them to be saints. Ah, hallelujah. He called you. He chose you. He saved you. He's keeping you. And he's coming back for his bride. And you will be there with him when he comes. And you're going to live with him eternally. And you're going to bless his name eternally. Why? Because you did not do it. You will give him the glory because he did it. And he didn't save you into a denomination. He saved you into his son. And you will worship him forever and never and never. Ooh, what a day that's going to be when we see Jesus. I thank God for Paul. I thank God for Peter. I thank God for James. I thank God for Jude. But more than anyone else, I thank God for Jesus. And I know you do too. Father, we thank you, praise you, that you have called us into your fellowship, into fellowship with you. Lord, I pray that this message encourages us and teaches us that, has taught us that we, we are in Christ. And yes, Lord, there is a need for the church to encourage one another. You, you've ordained the church for the strengthening of the saints. But Lord God, may we not be obliged or blindly follow a denomination but may we, with our eyes wide open, our eyes of faith wide open, follow you so that you alone will be glorified and that the world will see your value, your worth in the lives we live. We pray in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen.